64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker. I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today, we look at the storytelling animal. How stories make us human by uh, Jonathan Gostchild. In this video, I will talk about the primate Homo fictus, a fiction man, the great ape with a storytelling mind. You might not realize it, but you are a creature of an imaginative realm called Neverland. Neverland is your home, and before you die, you will spend decades there. If you haven't noticed this before, don't despair. Story is for a human, as water is for a fish. All-encompassing and not quite palpable. While your body is always fixed at a particular point in space-time, your mind is always free to ramble in lands of make-believe, and it does. I will talk about the insights from biology, psychology, and neuroscience to try and understand how and why stories are so important to human beings. Fictions, fantasies, dreams, these are, to the humanistic imagination, a kind of a sacred preserve. So stick around until the end and I will tell you a story about a free test and my program for self-actualization and self-transcendence called Master of Life Awareness. Tens of thousands of years ago, when the human mind was young and our numbers were few, we were telling one another stories. And now, tens of thousands of years later, when our species team across the globe, most of us still have strongly holding on to the myths about the origins of things, and we still thrill to an astonishing multitude of fictions and pages on stages and on screens. Murder stories, sex stories, war stories, conspiracy stories, true stories, and false. We are, as a species, addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. How bizarre is it that when we experience a story, whether in a book, a film, or a song, we allow ourselves to be evaded, invaded by the teller. The story maker penetrates our skulls and seizes control of our brain. Children the world over delight in stories and they start shaping their own pretend worlds as toddlers story is so central to the lives of young children that it comes close to defining their existence what do little kids do mostly they do story it is different for grown-ups of course we have work to do we can't play all day. In James Berry's play Peter Pan, 1904, the darling children adventure in Neverland. But eventually they get homesick and they return to the real world. The play suggests that kids have to grow up and growing up means leaving the pretend space called Neverland behind. Clever scientific studies involving Beepers and diaries suggest that an average daydream is about 14 seconds long. 
and that we have about 2,000 of them per day. In other words, we spend about half of our waking hours, one third of our lives on Earth, spinning fantasies. We daydream about the past, things we should have said or done, working through our victories and our failures. We daydream about mundane stuff, such as imagining different ways of handling a conflict at work. But we also daydream in a much more intense, story-like way. We scream, screen films with happy endings in our minds, where all of our wishes, vain, aggressive, dirty, come true. And we screen little horror films too, in which our worst fears are realized. We tell some of the best stories to ourselves. Scientists have discovered that the memories we use to form our own life stories are boldly fictionalized. And social psychologists point out that when we meet a friend, our conversations mostly consist of an exchange of gossipy stories. We ask our friend, what's up? Or what's new? And we begin to narrate our lives to one another, trading tales back and forth over cups of coffee or bottles of beer, unconsciously shaping and embellishing to make the tales hum. And every night we reconvene with our loved ones at the dinner table to share the small comedies and tragedies of our day. Then there are the rich stories in the bedrock of all of the traditions. There are story forms of jokes and urban legends about parting hard in Las Vegas and waking up minus one kidney. And what about poetry or stand-up comedy or the rapid rise of increasingly story-like video games that allow a player to be a character in a virtual reality drama? What about the ways many of us serialize our autobiographies in Facebook and in Twitter posts? Throughout stories, we learn about human culture and psychology without the potentially staggering cost of having to gain this experience firsthand. Or maybe story is a form of social glue that brings people together around common values. We also need to tackle a different possibility that story may be for nothing at all. At least not in biological terms. What are stories for? Nothing. The brain is not designed for story. There are glitches in its design that make it vulnerable to a story. Stories, in all their variety and splendor, are just lucky accidents of the mind's jury-rigged construction. Stories may educate us, deepen us, and give us joy. Story may be one of the things that makes it most worthwhile to be human, but that doesn't mean story has a biological purpose. As the linguist Noam Chomsky showed, all human languages share some basic structural similarities, a universal grammar. So too does a story. No matter how far we travel back into literally history, and no matter how deep we plunge into the jungles and banned lands of world folklore, we always find the same astonishing theme. Their stories are just like ours. There's a universal grammar in world fiction, a deep pattern of heroes confronting trouble and struggling to overcome stories universally focus on the great predicament of the human conditions. Stories about our sex and love, they're about the fear of death and the challenges of life, and they are about power, the desire to yield influence and to escape subjugation. Stories are not about going to the bathroom, driving to work, eating lunch, having the flu or making coffee, unless those activities can be tied back 
to a great predicament. Man is a storytelling animal. Wherever he goes, he wants to leave behind not a chaotic wake, not an empty space, but the comforting markers, boys, and trail signs of stories. He has to keep on making them up. As long as there's a story, it's all right. Even in his last moments, it is said that in that split second of a fatal fall, or when he's about to drown, he sees, passing rapidly before him, the story of his whole life. Specialized circuitry in the left hemisphere that is responsible for making sense of the torrent of information that the brain is always receiving from the environment. The job of this set of neural circuits is to detect order and meaning in that flow and to organize it into a coherent account of a person's experience into a story. In other words, Gazaniga named this brain structure the interpreter because of the quirky wiring of the brain visual information that enters the right eye is fed to the left brain and the information entering the left eye goes into the right brain in an intact brain visual information that goes to the left brain is then piped via the corpus callosum to the right brain but in a split-brain individual, information that enters only one eye gets marooned in the opposite hemisphere, leaving the other hemisphere in the dark. Stories make societies work better by encouraging us to behave ethically. As with sacred myths, ordinary stories from TV shows to fairy tales, steep us all in the same powerful norms and values. They relentless, relentlessly stigmatize antisocial behavior and just as relentlessly celebrate pro-social behavior. We learn by association that if we are more like the protagonists, we will be more apt to reap the typical rewards of the protagonists. For instance, love, social advancement, and other happy endings, and less likely to reap the rewards of an antagonist. For instance, death and disastrous loss of social standing. Humans leave great chunks of their lives inside fictional stories, in words where goodness is generally endorsed and rewarded, and badness is condemned and punished. These patterns don't just reflect a moralistic bias in human psychology. They seem to reinforce it. We think of ourselves as very stable and real, but our memories constrain our self-creation less than we think. And they are, they are constantly being disordered by our hopes and our dreams. Until the day we die, we are living the story of our lives. And like a novel in process, our life stories are always changing and evolving, being edited, rewritten, and embellished by an unreliable narrator. We are, in large part, our personal stories, and those stories are more truthy than true. Rejoice in the fantastic improbability of the twisting evolutionary path that made us creatures of story, that gave us all the gaudy, joyful, dynamism of the stories we tell and realize, most importantly, that understanding the power of storytelling, where it comes from and why it matters, cannot ever diminish your experience of it. Go and get lost in a novel, you'll see. And there you have it. Please, do help out. It is easy, simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out 
what actually motivates you, what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, your social awareness, your self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. Links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.